Italy has a very territorial geography. Italian cities, especially those that are at a close distance, often engage in rivalries over the best buildings, the most elaborate churches, the most unique recipes, the most notable artists, the best soccer teams, or the most distinguishing element of excellence. It all harkens back to the medieval communes and even more to the history of the Italian Renaissance where every city was a capital city and every court embodied its lord's unique personality, asserting his distinction and proclaiming his unrepeatable excellence. So Palazzo Vecchio in Florence embodied the power of its ruling family, the Medicis. The stunning Duca Palace of Urbino on the Adriatic coast reflected the extravagant personality of the city's lord, Federico da Montefeltro. The Ducal Palace of Ferrara, a couple hours north along the coastline, was the grandiose home of the Este family. The Ducal Palace of Mantua, moving northwest along the Po River, as well as the magnificent Palazzo Te, was the gorgeous seat of the Gonzaga family. And going up northwest in Lombardy, the castles of Pavia and Milan were expressions of the power, benevolence, and excellence of the Visconti and then Sforza families. These palaces displayed the influence of their lords, their primacy over their territory, and their ability to attract VIPs and great artists. So Brunelleschi, Poliziano, Botticelli and Michelangelo worked in Florence, Raphael in Urbino, the writers Ariosto and Tasso in Ferrara, the painter Mantegna and the opera inventor Monteverdi in Mantua, and Leonardo and Bramante in Milan. These palaces were also meant to impress visitors, making them stop in wonder, to contemplate the inimitable temperament of the city lord often visceral, eclectic, or megalomaniac, yet always in pursuit of a timeless distinction. The same urgency to compete with other lords, to create something awe-inspiring and inimitable, to reflect one's own personality in a visible form, a building or an artifact, to leave a perennial testament to one's own eclectic and unrepeatable character, is actually the core of Ferruccio Lamborghini's story. Lamborghini, of course, was the pioneering founder of one of the world's most renowned companies of luxury sports cars. His creative season was limited in time, only 10 years, perhaps like the life of a Renaissance Duke. Yet, he left an imprint which outlasted him through the excellence of his automobiles. In episode 4 on Enzo Ferrari, we explored the microcosm of Modena's car district, featuring in the radius of 50 miles three of the most exciting luxury car companies in the world, Ferrari, Lamborghini, Maserati. Today we'll use the model of the Renaissance courts as a lens to observe their headquarters as similar sites where the inimitable lifestyles and strong personalities of their founders was impressed in new admirable artifacts. In particular, today we'll consider the Italian car-making court of Sant'Agata Bolognese, which built its excellence out of the competition with Maranello, Ferrari. In our chat, we'll discuss the eclectic temperament of Ferruccio Lamborghini and his obsession for, dis for distinction. We'll discuss about rivalry as a typically Italian source of innovation and about design and technology as the means to fashion entrepreneurial urgency and assert one's own difference. Ferruccio Lamborghini was born near Ferrara in 1916. He was the son of a wine grape farmer, but more than in farming itself, he was interested in farming machines and mechanics. During World War II, he served in the Italian Royal Air Force as supervisor of a vehicle maintenance unit in Rhodes. Little side note here, you might be unfamiliar with this, but the Greek island of Rhodes was an Italian possession from 1912 when Italians conquered it as a military diversion of the larger conflict with Ottomans in Libya until 1947 after World War II. 
So in Rhodes, Lamborghini met Clelia Monti, whom he married in 1945 upon his return from war. Clelia would die only two years later, giving birth to his son, Tonino, now a renowned designer. And that is the event that stirred Lamborghini's entrepreneurial urge. So the year later, in 1948, he opened a factory of tractors and farming machines, a business that would rapidly make him a millionaire. Building on this capital, he would expand his business over the subsequent years following his eclectic temperament. So in 1959, he opened a factory of oil eaters, Lamborghini Bruciatori, which also later produced AC units for buildings. In 1969, he founded Lamborghini Oleo Dinamica, manufacturing hydraulic valves and equipment. He even experimented with the production of helicopters in the late 1950s. His real masterpiece, however, was the automotive company, which he started in 1963 and which made him famous throughout the world. And we'll talk more about this in a minute. Despite its huge success, however, Ferruccio Lamborghini actually owned and led this company for a very short time, until 1973, when he was forced to sell due to the financial troubles of his tractor company, which was nearly ruined by the cancellation of two big orders from Bolivia and South Africa. As a consequence, he would retire to Umbria, in Castiglione del Lago, near Perugia, where in the late 1970s, he actually got back to his family roots, starting the winery La Fiorita. He died in 1993, and his tombstone continues to be a testament to his incredible vitality and industriousness. Buon lavoro nella nuova casa di Dio, it states. May you keep working in the new house of God, to indicate his endless curiosity, entrepreneurial drive, and creative energy. So the story of Ferruccio Lamborghini is the story of a polyvalent man who never stopped chasing, innovating, pursuing, fighting to assert his difference. The logo of his company, a bull, is really the best reflection of his personality. Bullfighting is the key trait of his life story, but also of the first incredible decade of his car company, which broke three established boundaries and still thrives now under the Audi Group, in the production of classic cars like Diablo, Murcielago, Gallardo, but also police cars and boats. Now, to give you a sense of why and how this started, I want to take you back to 1963. Lamborghini was already wealthy from his tractor business, and of course, he loved cars. He wasn't fond of race cars, though, after the war, he modified the engine of his Fiat Topolino to run the Mille Miglia, but an accident during the competition convinced him to abandon active racing. So after that, he really started to collect road cars. Among them, of course, he owned a Ferrari 250 GT, which he bought in 1958, but he was soon dissatisfied with it. It was not a road car, it was noisy, unstable, and its clutches were often defective, causing him to spend long hours in Maranello for servicing. Given his mechanical ability developed in his work on airplane engines during the war, Lamborghini fixed the clutch flaws of his Ferrari by himself, applying the technology of his tractors to the car. It was his encounter with Enzo Ferrari, whom he had contacted to make him aware of the defect that sparked it all. Lamborghini's tips to improve the car infuriated Ferrari, who dismissed him with harsh words. I don't need advice from a tractor mechanic, he allegedly said. We mentioned earlier that rivalry or mistakes are a key drive to innovation. Well, after this exchange, Lamborghini got to work and in four months, he designed his own car in the newly opened factory of Sant'Agata Bolognese. And in 1963, he launched the Lambo 350 GT, which would completely reinvent the idea of a sports car. Unlike Ferraris, this was a luxury car for the road, not for racing. 
capable of high performance yet not compromising stability. Its parts were all handmade, the company didn't rely upon subcontractors, and the car was produced entirely at one site, so three vehicles a week. In addition, in response to Ferrari's unsatisfying service, Lamborghini offered his clients mechanical assistance wherever in a world a car had an issue. So just to make myself clear, out of his pocket, Lamborghini would fly mechanics to the UK, France and Spain to service a car, bring his apologies and thank them for their patience. Here is he explaining this seemingly exaggerated choice in some rare footage from 1968. It is a cost, but it is worth it because a client that has received such service will tell everybody. And by telling everybody, it becomes a promotion. So rivalry as a drive to excellence, as the urge to exceed expectations and state one's distinction. In 1966, Lamborghini would release what was probably his most iconic car, the Miura, not by chance named for a bull of the Spanish Corrida. To give you a sense of his confidence in delivering this car, here again is the voice of Ferruccio Lamborghini. I can assure you that the Miura will be a machine that will remain in the history of the automobile. The other ones will be cancelled, but the Miura will not. I can assure you that the Miura is a car that will remain in automobile history. Other cars, perhaps, will be forgotten, but not the Miura. So, a car that shapes new imaginative boundaries, an object that dares to remain, outlasting the ephemeral thrill of fashion, an artifact that projects his extravagant, even arrogant self-confidence and his inimitable temperament, as the old courts of Renaissance dukes did. The same profligacy will animate his last car, the Countach, released in 1974. Its name, taken from the Piedmontese expression of a mechanic working on it, means plague, contagion, reckless admiration for a jaw-dropping thing of beauty. The Countach was an even more arrogant car, with no trunk, no rear view mirror, and limited comfort that needed no exp explanation for its extravagance. Once again, who would dare to demand reasons for the extravagance of Palazzo Te in Mantua, the magnificent leisure palace of the Gonzaga family? The Countach was a statement car, where technology and design were tools to arouse marvel, to take you somewhere else, to make someone stop and look as in front of the Ducal Palace of Urbino, which moves us to ask, who owned this? What kind of temperament would the Duke have to challenge time like this? Now, the Lamborghini era lasted 10 years. The golden eras of several Italian courts were similarly short-lived. However, Lamborghini's legacy is very much alive and still there to be admired. What is fascinating in his story is the ability to turn a challenge into a resource, in his urgency to always outwit flaws, as well as the drive to turn a vehicle into a reflection of a peculiar human temperament. So what is fascinating in him is the power to transform a car into a human thing, a vehicle into a storyteller, and an artifact into a monument, literally, as the Latin expression monere mentem implies, literally warning our mind of the boldness, risk, audacity, conquests of its creator and owner. Italian car culture goes back to the racing urge which had been in inscribed in Italian DNA since the age of communes and the signorie. It's a story of endless competition, rivalries, tensions and divisions, yet also a story of lavish commissions, prodigality of talent, 
self-celebratory showmanship and display of power. Against this backdrop, where every city is a capital, reflecting the character of its leader in its buildings, objects also become projections of an inimitable and irreducible self. A self that cannot be reduced to social conformity or, if we think of today, to industrial serialization. The geography of the car district, or Motor Valley near Modena, is a microcosm of the geography of Italian courts. The immensely regarded factories of Ferrari, Lamborghini and Maserati are three manufacturing capitals born of the genius of three completely different characters, dueling in the common and endless pursuit of lasting excellence and distinction. Faced with this story, it appears clear, then, how much Italy is really a country of prima donnas, an incredible mess, but truly an incredibly diverse agglomerate of human capital and talent. Time for Italian now. Lamborghini è un imprenditore visionario, produttore di trattori, unità per l'aria condizionata, valvole idrauliche, vino, ma soprattutto di automobili straordinarie. La sua rivalità con Ferrari, il suo temperamento unico e la sua abilità meccanica costituiscono il motore della sua capacità di innovazione e l'origine di alcuni modelli di automobili da leggenda. That's it for today. Thank you very much for listening. I invite you to leave a review of this episode on iTunes, Spotify, Spreaker or YouTube as a way to support the project of this podcast. And I invite you to subscribe to the web page to get notifications for new episodes. You can also follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter for updates and additional materials on the podcast. Thanks again. Arrivederci e alla prossima.